Wonderful. So, uh, uh, hello, uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for uh, joining us uh, on today's seminar. Thank you uh, very much uh, to Sarah for uh, taking the initiative and uh, uh, letting the Czech uh, Embassy in uh, Israel be a host of uh, such a wonderful gathering of uh, brave men and women. Uh, and uh, is Vinikem Mia Pajalska, ja učila s Paruski v škole a pani Maju Nogavaru Plocho. So, <laughs> because uh, of me, probably we have to have this conversation uh, in English. Uh, it's really a great uh, honor uh, for us uh, as an embassy to hold such a, an, an event. Uh, you might ask yourself why uh, the Czech embassy in Tel Aviv. Uh, is the one chosen by Sara. Uh, many of the participants uh, had uh, personal relations uh, to Israel and uh, to Jewish people. And uh, I believe that uh, the, the bravery they showed uh, is uh, something that is very much uh, connected uh, to Jewish values. The, uh, uh, the uh, freedom of mind and spirit, and also the urge for uh, Tikkun Olam, one of the most important uh, principles uh, in, the, in Judaism, the, to make the world a better place, is uh, something uh, that uh, very much uh, connects us uh, to this topic. Also, uh, my ambassador, who can't join us today because he's uh, in Prague on the annual gathering uh, of Czech ambassadors, is uh, the minister that uh, had the honor to uh, give the highest uh, honor that uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, can give uh, to foreign citizens, the Gracias Agit, to the eight uh, brave uh, men and uh, women that uh, joined the demonstration uh, 53 years ago uh, on the Red Square. If you allow me, uh, I would like to put also some uh, personal uh, note on this. I, uh, I grew up in a family. My father uh, also uh, didn't agree with the occupation uh, in uh, 1968. And uh, the, uh, when he was 26, more or less his life uh, ended because he refused to uh, publicly uh, uh, condemn his uh, disapprovement of the fact and uh, he lost uh, his career and uh, I have to say that he ended up his life as a broken man and uh, he was not that brave uh, as the eight uh, women and men that we honor today and uh, I'm not sure whose life uh, was uh, more difficult of the people who did uh, pay the price for their bravery or the people that uh, paid the price for not uh, being uh, brave enough. So this was really important uh, for me to say and uh, I would like to give the uh, floor uh, to Sarah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Deputy Ambassador. On behalf of all the participants, I would like to express our gratitude to the Embassy of the Czech Republic in Israel uh, and to your staff, your amazing staff, uh, who immediately accepted to mark the 53rd anniversary of the demonstration on the Red Square. Uh, I would like to pay special thanks to you, uh, Ms. Katerina Moravtsova, and to uh, the assistant um, to the political section at the NBC, Ms. Veronika Beneshova, who played a critical role in putting this event uh, together. So we convened today to mark the 53rd anniversary of this demonstration and to pay really a tribute to the women and men who paid such a heavy price, as you mentioned, for those five minutes of freedom and for the slogan, for your freedom and ours. Larisa Bagaras, Vadim Delonay, Vladimir Dremlyuga, Konstantin Babitsky, Natalia Garbanievskaya, 
Pavel Litvinas, Viktor Feinberg, Tatiana Baeva. I also want to pay a special tribute to the youngest participant of this demonstration and maybe the youngest dissident of the Soviet dissident movement. He was a baby at the time. This is late Josef Gorbanievsky, the brother of Yaroslav Gorbanievsky, who is here with us today, and the son of late Natalia uh, Gorbanievska. So we convene today not to speak about the demonstration itself, its history, and uh, its complex and fascinating history, but really to try to think about the significance of this event for the Czech Republic, for the Russian Federation today, the Russian society, but also for Israel. Uh, I would like uh, to start maybe, we're waiting for uh, one of the participants, since we are hosted by the embassy of the Czech Republic in Israel, Maybe I will start with our Czech participants to open the floor and to really frame that discussion. And I would like to start with uh, Miss Mikaela Stoilova. She is a Prague-based educator and teacher who's been so actively involved in history and memory projects on the dissident movement. Uh, she's also active in an association called Post Bellum in Prague, and she's an excellent translator from Russian to Czech. So, Mikaela, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the word, Sarah. Uh, I feel, to be honest, I feel a little bit embarrassed to be a first speaker uh, in such a marvelous uh, company where I would uh, feel rather uh, as a listener. Uh, so, uh, as uh, my role in this gathering, um, I maybe would like to bring up uh, the idea of the uh, demonstration uh, in the later years, because um, I myself learned about the demonstration in early 90s. Uh, before that, uh, it wasn't impossible for me, uh, first because I was only 14 years old when we had uh, our Velvet Revolution, and uh, also because uh, the demonstration wasn't indeed uh, publicly known. Uh, Obviously, there uh, were, uh, as far as I know, two versions of uh, Natalia Gorbanevska uh, noon uh, in Czech Republic. So there were um, uh, limited, uh, there was limited knowledge about about the demonstration itself. But later on in 90s, we started to learn um, how important impact the demonstration had on people uh, in Czech Republic. Uh, there were uh, people or groups of people who learned about the demonstration and they didn't have a certain knowledge. They didn't know the facts. They didn't know how many people there were. They didn't know the names, but they still valued uh, the the act very much because uh, exactly as was said by Natalia Grubanievska, Pavel Litvinov and the others, uh, we wanted the Czech or Czechoslovakian, uh, correctly speaking, uh, people to know that not all the Soviet Union citizens approve the invasion. And I think that was perfectly done by the demonstration and not only by this demonstration, later on we learn about other people who expressed their disapproval of the invasion. And uh, I was present uh, during the um, late 90s and uh, 2010 uh, and later on events uh, when uh, the Institute of uh, Study of Totalitarian Regime and other organization were trying uh, to remember uh, the demonstration and other acts of protest. And I was sometimes surprised myself how warmly uh, Czech people will come 
the uh, participants of the demonstration or other people who were brave enough to to step out and speak out. Uh, so uh, that is maybe uh, what I can say about the um, about the Czech people, uh, especially after the 1998 uh, 1989 uh, and the reception of uh, this demonstration. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that uh, Jefim Fischstein can be more precise and uh, bring more, I would say, hard data about, uh, about those events. Thank you so much, uh, Mikaela Stolova, for your words. I would like to introduce now um, Mr. Jefim Fischstein, uh, who uh, served as former director of the Russian service of the Radio Liberty. He's the former editor-in-chief of the Czech uh, newspaper Lidove Novini, uh, the main political daily in, in Prague, and he's the author of numerous books and documentaries and a very, very uh, followed political uh, writer and commentator. Yefim, please. Thank you, Sarah. <coughs> It's true, I am a guy of double identities, so to say, because I'm in a way born in Russia, but uh, but spent uh, more of my majority of my of my life in the Czech or Czechoslovakia at that time, Czech, Czech Republic. So I can speak actually both sides uh, on behalf of the Russians or Soviet. Uh, citizens and on behalf of the Czechoslovak or Czech citizens at the same time. Speaking about the Magnificent Seven, how the demonstrators are called among the Czechs after the well-known Western film, uh, people who demonstrated on the Red Square, we can from time to time, but rather often, hear uh, Compassion, but very false, very false sentence. What actually the sacrifice proved to change in the Russian society, maybe in the world. If not then, would the development in Russia go in essentially different way or not? At the end of the day, wasn't the noble and selfless gesture in vain, without real effect? on political reality. After all, was it worth years in jail or in mental hospitals? We know that such questions are absolutely wrong because it goes in wrong direction. Uh, we cannot measure the final effect of such deeds by immediate result or immediate political response. <clears throat> because we are speaking about the kind of behavior, actually, that is not a political gesture. It's a, an act of spiritual resistance. To be precise, the correct measurement should be rather metaphysical than politic. The proper effect is seen now, is seen elsewhere, whereas the names of their executioner are long forgotten for good, their own names are still well known. And the importance of this, I would say, tiny rebellion is still growing. They themselves cer certainly <clears throat> know, know this at the very moment of their heroic gathering on the Red Square. By the way, from the very beginning, the demonstration was meant as a completely voluntary undertaking. Nobody of demonstrators knew for sure who will come and who will not. That's why even today we have problems with identifying the numbers, the number of the uh, participants. Some say seven, the magnificent seven, some say magnificent eight, and some say the magnificent eight and a half, because Joseph Gorbanevsky was a little baby at that time, half a man. So 
<clears throat> the slogan of the manifestation, uh, manifestation of the existential bravery sounded as uh, <clears throat> Misha said, or Sarah said before, maybe, for your and our freedom, for your freedom and ours. The addressee of this appeal was the people of Czechoslovakia invaded at that time by Soviet troops. Maybe it's coincidence, maybe the coincidence is purely, purely occasional, but it has its specific connotations. The Czech sense of courage is not that of massive heroism. Differently from the neighboring, neighboring uh, peoples like Hungarian or Polish that have uh, extremely courageous tradition, but other than the Czech tradition. Those two neighboring nations is, are known uh, by readiness to stand up and, and to put up massive resistance to aggressors of any kind. <clears throat> But there is a wise saying in all the languages that I know. <clears throat> it's a bad time if a nation needs heroes. I would add to that, but it's even worse if nation needs heroes and there is no one who stands up and says, I am here. A Czech way of heroism is deeply personal. Czech society in such fatal moments generates single figures, but figures of highest moral qualities, who take the full burden of destiny in name and on behalf of all the compatriots on their own shoulders. <clears throat> As if they would draw a magic line, a magic circle in the dust or in the sand, which represents a moral border that nobody can trespass because beyond the border, a nation stops to be a nation. You know the examples from Jan Hus who died on bonfire uh, for his personal beliefs, personal religious truth, ending with Jan Pauch who protested the Soviet occupation with, with uh, an act of self-immolation. In a way, this Red Square demonstration is a very Czech one. It's the Czech manner of confronting, confronting evil, unfriendly events, triste events, and so on. That's why <clears throat> the Czechs received the, this attitude, this demonstration with double understanding and double gratitude. Now the Russians, I would say, are going through very bad times when the Moscow authorities <clears throat> do their best to rewrite the history, to <clears throat> prove that the <clears throat> intervention into Czechoslovakia was the rightest thing to do under the sun <clears throat> was uh, absolutely right and they would repeat it any time as they say we can repeat it so <clears throat> this act of solidarity personal solita solidarity just is gaining the importance and symbolism, symbolism for the Czech people. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> if the Russians, I would say on behalf of the Czech people, if the Russians want not, want not to have this episode in their textbooks of history, so this episode won't be an orphan. Just let it be a piece of the Czech history. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ifim Finstein, for your powerful words. I would like now to give uh, the floor to Yaroslav Gorbanievsky, the son of late Natalia Gorbanievskaya. 
Yaroslav uh, Garbaniewski is an artist and an educator, a teacher, and he actually wrote um, a text, uh, a tribute in Russian uh, that we that he translated into French and English. So, with your permission, he will read his text uh, in French, and I will translate in English. It's going to take the same time. We're going to work as a duet. Yaroslav. Uh, ça, oui, <laughs> je vais dire quelques mots à propos de la manifestation, uh, mais je ne pense pas que, je te demande de traduire Sarah, je ne pense pas que je suis uh, mieux placé pour en parler parce que je suis le fils de Natalia Gorbanevskaya. Je suis euh, un homme comme n'importe quel homme dans ce monde et qui parle juste comme, euh, comme une personne humaine. So, I, I'm going to say a few words about the demonstration. I am not the best position person to speak about this demonstration. I am only the son of Natalia Gormanievska. I, I am a man like other men, but I will try to say a few words. Des sept manifestants de la Place Rouge, aujourd'hui, il n'en reste que deux. Among the seven demonstra uh, demonstrators on the Red Square today, only two are still with us. Pavel Litvinov et Viktor Feinberg. Pavel Litvinov and Viktor Feinberg. Encore quelques années et la manifestation de 68 deviendra un sujet d'études universitaires. In a few years from now, the 1968 demonstration shall become a topic of strictly academic research. Alors, faut-il encore s'en souvenir? Faut-il y penser? As such, does it make sense to remember it? Is it still worthwhile to think about it? Les manifestants n'ont pas arrêté la marche des tanks à travers la Tchécoslovaquie. The demonstrators did not stop the Soviet tanks incursion through Czechoslovakia. Ils n'ont pas empêché la soi-disant normalisation qui a replongé les Tchèques et les Slovaques dans le monde étouffant de l'esclavage communiste physique et spirituel. Nor did they contain the so-called normalization that pushed back the Czech and Slovak peoples to the suffocating world of communist slavery that was physical and spiritual in nature. Les manifestants n'ont pas empêché l'invasion soviétique en Afghanistan en 1979 et n'ont pas arrêté la vague de barbarie inhumaine des talibans d'aujourd'hui. The demonstrators did not stop the 1979 Soviet incursion into Afghanistan either. Or did they curb, or they didn't curb either, the current wave of aggressive and inhuman barbarism of the Taliban? Ils n'ont pas empêché la nouvelle Russie de porter la guerre, la violence et la mort dans les pays voisins et fraternels de la Géorgie et de l'Ukraine. They didn't prevent the new Russia from launching a war and sowing violence and death to their neighboring and brother countries, Georgia and Ukraine. Ils n'ont pas empêché la nouvelle Russie d'écraser et de détruire tout ce qui est digne, qui naît et qui respire dans la nouvelle Russie. Nor did they prevent the new Russia from crushing and breaking everything worthy that is born and breathes in today's Russia. Ma mère, Natalia Gorbanevskaya, qui avait pris part à cette manifestation sur la Place Rouge le 25 août 68, écrivait plus tard dans un poème « Je n'ai pu sauver ni Varsovie ni Prague ». My mother, Natalia Gorbanevskaya, who participated in the Red Square demonstration of August 25, 1968, later wrote in one of her poems « I didn't save either Warsaw or Prague. Alors, à quoi bon cette manifestation aujourd'hui? 
Est-ce qu'on en a besoin? So, why should we need this demonstration today? Do we still need it? Larissa Bogoraz et Vadim Delaunay, Vladimir Dremluga et Konstantin Babitsky, Natalia Gorbanevskaya, Pavel Litvinov et Victor Feinberg ont payé cher ce court souffle de liberté sur la place rouge. Larissa Bagaras et Vadim Dolonev, Vladimir Dremluga, Konstantin Babitsky, Natalia Gorbanevska, Pavel Litvinov et Victor Feinberg paid a heavy price for a breath of freedom on the Red Square. Ce souffle n'était pas le seul dans son genre. Il y en a eu bien d'autres à côté de celui de la Place Rouge. This breath of freedom was not the only one, because there were and there are many others, not only on the Red Square on August 25. Et c'est cet air volé que je respire encore aujourd'hui. For today, I still breathe this stolen air. Cet air conserve ma dignité humaine. Il ne me laisse pas oublier que la liberté existe. This air preserves my human dignity and doesn't allow me to forget that freedom exists. Sans ce souffle, je pense que depuis longtemps j'aurais sombré dans la grisaille de l'absurde. Without this air, I would have long ago plunged into a grey absurdity. Et je sais que ce souffle aide beaucoup de gens à respirer. I know this air helps so many others to breathe. Je rencontre bien des gens, des tout jeunes et des tout vieux, qui apprennent ainsi à respirer et à sentir et à penser. I've met people, some older, some younger, who learn to breathe and feel and think. Quant au grand bouleversement de la société, quant au destin des grandes puissances, des civilisations, des peuples et des nations, tous ils sont composés d'individus dont chacun est libre de respirer en grand coup. As for the major social shifts, the fate of powers and the cultural historical areas, as for peoples and nations, They all consist of individuals, each of whom is free to take a deep breath. C'est comme ça que je le vois. At least, this is the way I see it. Merci. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Yaroslav, for your powerful words. I would like to pass along to the granddaughter of Natalia Gorbanievskaya. Ms. Nusia Krasavitska, who is joining us from Moscow, she's a very talented artist herself, and she's the author of a book, a children's book, on Natalia uh, Garbanievskaya. And Nusia, the floor is yours. <laughs> uh, hello. Um... I would like to say that um, I'm I'm very thankful uh, for 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 you hear me yeah um, sorry um, for for Sarah uh, and uh, for Embassy that you uh, make this event uh, because I think it's very important um, to speak about uh, this event this this demonstration um, like all the time and. Uh, Uh, yes, I'm, I'm uh, an artist and um, right now I am um, illustrated the books for children and um, also I, I made the illustration for the book about my uh, grandmother, about Natalia Gorbanevska, uh, the ch books for children. Uh, and um, right now in Russia uh, was published another book about uh, 25 August. Um, I, I have it here, I will show you the book. Uh, this book called uh, 25 August uh, and uh, it's really different uh, um, that um, was mine. Um, 
because my my book was a really personal story about uh, a woman, a brave woman, uh, a very talented woman uh, who make um, her own history, who made the history of her country, of history of the world. Um, and this book uh, is really different. Um, uh, it's, I'm sorry. Um, uh, it's uh, it's really different. It's a book about um, more about history. Uh, it um, tells about the revolution uh, in Russia. It tells about the uh, Soviet Union. It tells about um, uh, all the story about Czechoslovakia. And uh, when I read that book, that that book, when I when I see it, I saw it. Um, uh, my first thought was like, wow, how many different ways you can uh, make, you can choose when you decide to uh, tell this story to somebody, uh, especially for children. But I think it's um, for everybody, it's like this. Uh, so you can choose the personal way. Uh, when you spoke about the people in demonstration, you can choose the historical way, you can choose the political way, uh, you can choose the moral way about uh, how brave uh, it, it is. Uh, and uh, I think because of this, uh, this story will be, will never be old will never be forgotten because this is a um, story which have a lot of aspects, uh, a lot of thoughts, a lot of ideas and um, time changing, uh, countries changing, people changing, uh, but this story will always have uh, humans who would would who need to know it. Uh, and uh, because of this, also, I am very glad that Ksusha Saharnova right now making uh, the film uh, about Victor Feinberg. Uh, and uh, there will be uh, three docu documentaries uh, who made Ksusha and her husband um, about this event. And uh, I think all films will be very different because the film Five Minutes of, of Freedom is very different uh, from a film about Natalia Gorbanevska, I'm not a hero, I'm not a heroine. Uh, and um, I think it's very good and we need it. So this is it. Thank you a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you for your for your strong words. I would like to give the floor to Ilya Rips. To Ilya Rips, he's known as the Latvian Jan Palach. Ilya uh, Rips uh, attempted uh, to self-immolate in April 1969 as a sign of solidarity with Jan Palach, as a sign of protest against the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia. Ilya Rips embodies uh, those um, multiple protests that occurred, that unfolded in the provinces of Moscow, in the provinces of the Soviet Union to protest the Soviet invasion of uh, Czechoslovakia and that are well uh, less known by the general public. Ilya Rips is a professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, a very well-known professor in Israel. Uh, Ilya Aronovich, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. First, let me tell that I'm greatly honored by this invitation oh, and the possibility to speak here so noble persons are sitting here and their sons, daughters, grandsons and granddaughters. When I received this invitation, so it made me think about the days of old and just what 
was then the feelings and the things that caused to to act in a way it was then. So when I'm returning to this and trying to put it in a certain framework, let me just start with a verse by the great Russian poet Osip Mandelstam. Человеческий жаркий искривленный рот негодует и нет говорит. So saying no. Actually, this verse expresses all the, all this story. But now let me just go in a little more detail. So this for me was something extremely personal. It was not something political. Back then, I could not imagine that this protest could have any impact of the course of events. So just something deeply personal. Before it, the Prague Spring unfolded like an unbelievable fairy tale, like dream. And then the Prague Spring was crushed by the Soviet tanks. I spent several months feeling being suffocated by a sense of powerlessness and shame. Then it exploded in some way. I must say that at that time, it seemed to me that the existing Soviet power would be forever. I could not imagine any way out of it because they would not concede any grain, any minuscule of their absolute power. So it was not about something changing the event, just expressing the attitude by what cost it would be. And also it would give a proof that no measure of suppression will could strangle any kind of protest. But yeah. now I know now at learned that from history that many other desperate acts of protests were simply unnoticed. And uh, in any case, in my own situation, at the end of the day, I was in the hands of KGB. Okay. It just then I knew that the Soviet power would very much like to have a power, public, as you know, repentance from the dissidents. Just say, I regret, I was wrong, etc., etc. Therefore, there was a new ultimate objective simply not to the now, not to disavow what was already accomplished, not to make any kind of concession, given that we are full in their hands and they can threat you with everything. So what should be the reaction? Just say what will happen now is fully indifferent for me. And if I'm feeling this way, they're powerless. They, their threats have no impact. Okay. And this was the way that I would to keep all my power just to make this point. What happened later is was just a chain of miracles, but didn't depend on me. I was later in Israel, I become a mathematician as I planned in the younger days, etc. Now, let me just say one thing more. The unfreedom exists today in many corners of the world, sometimes of a more sophisticated cover, something in very broad form. And then when unfreedom reigns, let me say, I don't see a path to liberation. The power is stronger than the collective power of the people. And therefore, let me say only one thing. 
to those who value freedom. Preserve the freedom as long it exists. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ilya Rips, for uh, such a powerful statement. I would like to conclude uh, this session uh, by giving uh, the floor to Ms. Ksenia Sakharnova. Ksenia Sakharnova and uh, her husband, Kirill Sakharnov, are young and talented and brave uh, Moscow-based documentarists who have uh, explored and um, memorialized, maybe better than any other, uh, this demonstration on the Red Square. They are, they are the authors of three documentary movies on this demonstration. The first one is Five Minutes of Freedom. The second one is Natalia Garbanievskaya, I Am Not a Hero. And the third one that will be released in Prague in November 2021, uh, in months or two months from now, is entitled Victor Feinberg Acharai. And um, Xenia and Kirill have gathered a tremendous amount of archival, archival materials, of interviews, of testimonies on this demonstration, on the participants, and on its uh, uh, current significance. So Xenia, please. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Nusia, for these wonderful words about our movies. I'm very happy to see all participants of this discussion. I sincerely thank Sarah, Katarina and Veronica from Czech Embassy in Tel Aviv for organizing this event. And I will tell about my experience. Um, the history of the demonstration on Red Square against the invasion of Czechoslovakia became a turning point in my life and in the life of my husband, Kirill, too, because it began our journey into the world of documentary cinema. I do not belong to a dissident family. My father is a diplomat. He worked for many years in Poland, where I was born, and my family never spoke about the dissident movement. Also, my parents supported democratic changes in our country. I learned about the demonstration when I was already 27 years old. And I wanted to find out who of the demonstrators was still alive. And so I found Natalia Gorbanievska's page on the Life Journal, and I wrote her a big letter. This is how it all began. And then I and I saw a short video on the internet how young civic activists organized the same action in the Red Square on the day of the 40th anniversary of the demonstration. They came out with a poster for your and our freedom. And their protest also lasted no more than five minutes. So I got the idea for the film Five Minutes of Freedom. The goal was to show the two generations of human rights fighters find common ground between them and give viewers the opportunity to draw their own conclusions. Natalia Gorbanievska, Natasha, as she always asked to call herself, has already introduced us to Pavel Litvinov and Viktor Feinberg. With Pavel Mikhailovich and his wife, Julia, we set off on a, a, my amazing adventure in Transbaikalia to the place of his exile. We found the, the mine where he worked, met his friends, and it was a very warm and emotional journey. And uh, as for Viktor Feinberg, this is a very special story. Natasha Gorbanevska said, you must film Feinberg. So we couldn't resist. And we went and we went to Paris and spent four days with Viktor Isakovich. We hardly saw Paris. We filmed interviews and drank French wine. Uh, it was 10 years ago. Uh, for us, it was surprising that Feinberg talk about his experience in the Butyrka prison and in the Leningrad uh, psychiatric hospital, the way a fairy tale is told, but only a terrible tale. And we got the impression that it was uh, in prison that he could do as much as possible for freedom of others. 
Then, uh, therefore, he willingly remembered and told us about it. And we finished the film. It was screened at many festivals and TV channels in Russia, Czech Republic, Poland, Belarus. And I'm very happy that it is screened 10 years later. So literally three days ago, on the next anniversary of the Czechoslovak events, Five Minutes of Freedom was again show on the current time channel. Uh, but for me, it is especially important that film uh, was, uh, has been shown on Czech television several times and Czech people can uh, see it. Uh, the film does not uh, lose its relevance because even then, more than 10 years ago, we felt that we were losing our freedom. Today, there is no freedom at all in Russia. We are back in the Brezhnev era, if not worse. But I would like to tell you about our new film about Viktor Feinberg. The idea to make this film was born in 2018. By this time, we had made another film in memory of Natalia Gorbanevska. It's called Natalia Gorbanevska, I'm not a hero. And it was released in 2016. And in August 2018, we celebrated in Moscow the, uh, the 40th anniversary of the demonstration on Red Square. The event was organized by our friend Alexei Bogansev, who gathered the children and grandchildren of the demonstrators at the Lobne Mesta on August 25, exactly at noon. And among the participants of the demonstration, we had Pavel Litvinov. This was, uh, this was such a a wonderful continuity of generations. Uh, Viktor Isakovich was represented on Red Square bus by his daughter Sarah, and then we met uh, for, the for the first time Liv. And after this memorable action, there was a screening of the Five Minutes of Freedom in the Sakharov Center, which was attended by all the participants of the action. And when the film ended, Sarah came up to me and said, let's make a film about that. I said, yes, of course. <laughs> In November 2018, we traveled to France. Thanks God, it was before the pandemic. And for a few more days, we filmed Viktor Isakovich. In November, Viktor Feinberg will turn 20, uh, oh, I'm sorry, 90 <laughs> years old. By this time, we should have released the film. After the death of Sergei Kovalev, Viktor Isakovich became the oldest member of the Soviet human rights movement. And we feel that it is our duty to complete the movie about him. And we dream to do it during his life so that he can see it. Uh, since, since it is impossible to find a budget for such films in Russia, when we opened crowdfunding in the Czech Republic on the post Bellum platform. And for this, I would to thank our friend in Prague, Mihaila Stoilova. Misha, thank you very much. Uh, we have already collected most of the funds. Uh, 185 people from all over the world supported this film. We need to collect only 13%. And uh, all the information about the crowdfunding you can find on Facebook page of the film Viktor Feinberg Aharai and on Post Bellum page too. We are now actively working on the film and we really hope to finish it uh, for the anniversary of Viktor Feinberg. And I would like to thank all viewers and sponsors, and sponsors for their support. Thank you. Thank you very much to all the participants. Thank you, uh, Ms. Katerina Moravtsova, Ms. Veronika Beneshova for making this event possible. We really thank you. And thank you to all the participants. Thank you very much, Sara. Thank you to the participants. It was a great uh, honor and privilege uh, to spend time with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And refresh Thank Lema. you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks from Prague.